so there's been kind of a little uh, permaculture theme or food security theme this weekend with at least one other permaculture presentation. Uh, there's another one on a different topic that's very important uh, uh, in the same category of, uh, I would call it, put, put it all together in food security. You know, tomorrow we're going to be talking about the uh, pretty much the most efficient way to purify water in the world is sitting right over here that we're going to be, uh, Paul's going to be presenting on. So all this is very important to me and a lot of other people. I've gotten feedback over the years and that's why, especially right now, and, you know, I'm pretty sure nobody in here wants to eat bugs and lab-grown meat. And, uh, you know, there's uh, some good options available to us. So um, Paul Wheaton uh, is a uh, prominent uh, permaculture advocate uh, known as the Duke of Permaculture. And the Occupy Monsanto movement, if anybody of you remember that, uh, uh, named him the bad boy of permaculture. Uh, his, web <laughs> his websites include permies.com, uh, which I believe is referenced uh, quite often as uh, being uh, one of the world's largest, if not the largest, uh, websites on the permaculture topic. And it's a wealth of resources. Uh, there's also coderanch.com, richsoil.com, and wheaton-labs.com. Um, with over 600 podcasts, 200 YouTube videos, um, and a dozen feature-length films, he has shared his experience at 100-plus events. Now it's 101. Okay, today, oh, look, I have things. I have so many things. I've made so many things. And I've and I got to say, like, you know, I've got so many things, but they're not exactly made just by me. There's, like, uh, about 100 people who helped me make all these things. Look, there goes one right now. <laughs> And it, so that's why it seems like I make so many things, and really, I'm, uh, I, I've got lots of friends. Um, today, I'm going to talk about Wafati stuff, because that's what I was asked to present about. Usually, it seems like more about, people want me to present about um, uh, food stuff, about uh, horticulture, about growing things, and, and I'm a big advocate of hugel culture, and I want to, in fact, I've already been getting asked a lot of questions by several of you just before this started uh, about a lot of my growing systems, my philosophies about different things about horticulture. And then the next thing is, and it seems like it'd be a good fit for this group, would be to talk about rocket mass heaters. Who's here? Who's heard of rocket mass heaters? Oh, oh, yes. See, it would have been great. Um, but today we're going to probably focus. In fact, I asked Aaron, I said, I heard you want me to focus on the timber framing joinery, the roundwood timber. And he's like, and the look on his face said, oh, wait, oh, there I got to signal it. Yes, yes, oh, I love it when people want it. And I kind of, by the look on Aaron's face, it was like, no. <laughs> it was like, no, annualized thermal inertia. That's what everybody wants to talk about. That's what they want to hear about. <sighs> Here's the annualized thermal inertia, which I'm going to attempt to present on tonight. Um, but I also want to talk about Freaky Cheap. Mike Ayler, that's how you spell his name. And I don't think it would be wise to build this anywhere but on a woodland. Um, so many people build straw bale homes like a thousand miles away from where the straw bales come from. I don't understand that. But I'm hoping for freaky cheap, like I explained earlier. Um, so I have forest, and if you're here in the Spokane area, I used to have 80 acres up on Mount Spokane. But <clears throat> we needed to thin our forest. If we didn't, we were subjected to um, uh, wildfires. And so it was, it was pretty important to get in there and thin it. Now, I've got some powerful theories about forest land and how to manage forest land versus how to manage woodland. And the difference primarily is, is that with forest land, you got like one person every 20,000 acres, and that person's getting paid to go out and spray weeds or determine when it's time to go cut down trees or things of that nature. But with a woodland, it's going to be more like one person for 40 acres, and that person lives there. We also uh, have done a lot of buildings without any concrete or cement. Um, and there's reasons. We have reasons for all of this stuff. How many people have either had cancer or know somebody close to them that has had cancer? So I have a crazy theory. And because you're my tribe, you're going to be cool with this crazy theory. My crazy theory is cancer comes from carcinogens. I, it's, I know. It's, it's like, you know, if you try to tell a doctor that, it's like, no, it doesn't. It comes from the cancer fairy. Some people get it. Some people don't. It's random. There's nothing you can do. It's nothing about your environment. 
So I kind of have a bunch of stuff. The way that we build things is like with the idea of like, let's eliminate the carcinogens, both known and unknown. And that's our mission. This is the rocket mass heater that is the star of the book, uh, Rocket Mass Heater Builder's Guide by Erica and Ernie Wisner. How many people have looked at that book? Yeah, baby. Uh, how many people have ever heard the phrase rocket mass heater before? <laughs> okay, good, good. Yeah, this is my tribe. Okay, so uh, here we've got, this, is, this building isn't even complete yet. At this point, it's about 40% complete. But um, there have been a lot of people living in it because of the rocket mass heater. We have a rocket mass heater in there because the building's not done yet. Even though it starts do it has some of the attributes of the annualized thermal inertia, um, but later it'll have far, far more, and then people just won't use the rocket mass heater unless somebody, unless somebody in the house is sick and they want to take the temperature up really, really hot or something like that. Once upon a time, we got an idea to install a gray water system. Look at that belly! So water from a kitchen sink could go to plants instead of to a septic tank. Except those plants will be dormant in winter, so any funky sink stuff would just build up and be gross. How about if we made a small greenhouse? Greenhouses are famous for needing more heat than homes. All that glass is a very poor insulator. Plus, they can get too hot on a sunny day and kill everything in the greenhouse. We have a lot of projects here doing amazing things to solve heating problems. So can we invent a greenhouse that never gets too cold or too hot? So here we are building that little greenhouse. We did all the experiments. We did all those things. I'm going to show all to you being built as, as we go on here. Um, and we did it mostly with logs and mud found on the property. So, and we'll show you, we'll see it as, it, as we go through the build. Um, <clears throat> let's see. And on top of that, while I still think it's, it's a quite, a, I, I have a lot of ideas. If we were to do this again, how to do it much faster, much easier, uh, even better, etc. But for now, let's just look at what we did do. Beep, 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 beep. Now, here you can see one of the, the little charts. Uh, this is from the, uh, a tracking thermometer that was down inside one of those thermal wells. And so you can kind of see every time the sun comes out, it, it peaks up a little bit, and then at night it drops down a bit. But cumulatively, it's getting warmer. And it's that upward trend that is what we need to warm the ground 20, 20 31 feet underground. So Mike Ayler says that his designs are earthquake proof, they are wildfire proof, and they are like pretty much everything proof except for one thing. They are not flood proof. They have to be built on a hillside so that way you have full control of the water going around it. All right. Okay, I thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's awesome.